Numerical Computation, Chapter 2, Video Number 5. Let's take an example and to see how um, this procedure is being carried out. So we're looking at a data set um, which contains four points as here, so it will fit in a polynomial of degree 3. So we follow the procedure of computing the divided difference and we set up this triangular table for our computation. So first we list the data points of x, so x0, x1, x2, x3 as the additional column outside. And then we um, initiate the recursive computation by filling in the first column and this will be just the data for y i so which will be these numbers one zero and a half and zero point eight six six so which i filled up here and now we are ready to compute the next column so um let's see how is this number negative one computed let's write it out so the negative one here is computed by taking um this minus that over this minus that so let me write it out so it will be zero minus one over one minus zero which is negative one and that's the number that goes in here okay and then for the next one we will be taking um in the same way we'll be doing 0 0.5 minus 1 over 2 third minus 1 so which i will write out so this will be 0 0.5 minus 0 over 2 3 minus 1 and you work out that number you know it's negative 1.5 which goes here and for the last number it's computed by doing this minus that over this minus that so let me write it down so that will be 0 0.866 minus 0 0.5 over one third minus two third and if you evaluate the values out you get about negative 1.0981 one and that's the number that goes in to the last position in that column so once this is computed then we are ready to go on to the next column so how are these two numbers in the next column computed so this one here is computed by taking this one minus that one over what shall be in the denominator we shall be careful here. So this is a divided difference that takes three axes as its input. So the denominator will be the last x minus the first x, right? So it's two third minus zero. So let me write it out. So that will be negative 1.5 minus negative one over two third minus zero, right? And if you work it out, you will get negative 0 0.75, which is this value. And similarly, the value here you shall be computed by taking this minus that. That's pretty obvious. But what's in the denominator? It shall be 1 third minus 1. Okay, you have to skip 1x in between. So let me write it. So that will be negative 1.09. 8, 1 minus negative 1.5 over the denominator will be 1 third minus 1. And if you work out this about 0, negative 0 0.6029, and this gives me this number. Okay, so now you see we have two numbers left, which means we can continue one more time to compute one more value okay so and this final value is computed by doing this one minus that in the numerator which is pretty clear so let me write it so it's negative 0 0.6029 minus negative 0 0.75 
and then what's in the denominator. So remember, this is the divided difference with this is 1x, 2x, 3x, that with 4x in there. So you have to skip the middle two. So you would take the last x minus the first x. So it's 1 third minus 0. Right? And then you work out these numbers and that is exactly what you get, 0 0.4413. So I think um, the numerator is pretty clear, that is, you would just take the previous column, the two neighboring ones, subtracting each other give you the numerator. So please be careful, pay attention to what happens in the denominator. So as you go deeper and deeper into higher indexes of columns, you will have to skip some axes to get the denominator. Okay, so this is usually a spot student gets confused, so make sure it's clear to you. Okay, let's extract the A value. So we know the diagonal ones will be our A, so that will be A0, that's A1, and that's A2, and that's A3. And then we can um, put these A's in and write out the Newton's form. So P3 now equals to A0 plus A1x plus A2x times x minus 1, and that's x minus x0 times x minus x1. And A3 times x minus x0, x minus x1, x minus x2. Now let's try to um, answer this question which we asked at the end of the Lagrange polynomial. So the whole point of um, designing this Newton's form is that we require some flexibility in, with respect to adding an additional point to interpolate. So think now, if I want to add an additional point, let's say, just throwing some numbers, say I want to add one point, and let's say, um, and 0 0.5 and it shall be on 0 0.7 okay so and should I throw away all the computations I have done already or can I use it and just add one more term and you see very clearly one can easily do that isn't it so all I need to do will be adding one more rows down here so I will add 0 0.5 here and I will add 0 0.7 here, all I need to do is to compute these values and compute the final value here. And that will be my A4. So the whole point here is that I do not need to throw away what I have already done. I just need to build on top of that to obtain additional information for my Newton's polynomial to interpolate an additional point. So yes, the answer is yes, that is, the Newton's form is flexible with respect to adding additional points to interpolate. We now look at how to efficiently implement Newton's polynomial into a computer. So let's write out Newton's form. It takes this form that we are quite familiar by now a0 and then a1 times this product and a2 times this product and all the way to a n times their n of such product here. So thinking about implementation, how would you write a code? Now since there are um, an n plus 1 such terms that will require a for loop, let's say for i, from 0, 1, 2 and all the way to n. And then in each for loop, so when i equals to 0, there's nothing to do. When i equals to 1, you have one multiplication. And then when i equals to 2, you have two multiplications. And then when i equals to n, you have n multiplications. So one for loop is not enough. So inside each for loop, you need to go through another for loop. Let's say for k equals to goes from um, 0 to i. And let's do a work count to see how many operations are needed. So in a computer, each 
operation it does, a multiplication, a subtraction, or addition, is called a flop. Okay, so let's do a count of how many number of flops that's needed if we compute the polynomial in the way as it's written now. So we see the the first one are equals to zero. There's nothing to do, but it has it will be later on added on top of something. So we'll get one flop from there, and then for the second expression, um, you have a subtraction and a multiplication, and then you have to add on top. So it's um, three, and then the next one you see you have two subtractions, so one, two, and then a multiplication, another, three and four, and you have to add it on top. So this is five, and then you can easily imagine and the next one will be seven flops, and so on. And it appears that um, for the term i, um, the number you um, flops you have is something like 2n plus one, right? So this will be 2n plus one. So what is the sum of all these numbers? So you see 1 plus 3 is 4, and then four, that's 2 square, 4 plus 5 is 9, that's um, 3 square, 9 plus 7 is 16, that's 4 square. You can probably do induction, and this will give you a square. So adding all the way to 2n plus 1, we see that this actually gives me n plus 1 squared, okay? So for n large, this takes quite some computation. And furthermore, we can look back into the Newton's form of the polynomial. Take, for example, the term x minus x0. It appears here, and it appears here, and it appears here, and appears in like n, um, n terms actually, and each time we are computing it for new, so actually we don't have to do that. Now we look at the Newton's form in this particular way, it's called the nested form. So let's take a0 first and write it there. And take away a0 from the expression and looking at the Newton's polynomial, the rest the remaining n terms, and we see that it has a common factor. So what will be that common factor? Let's underlie it. Every term has this factor, right? So we can take out this factor and uh, write it here, and then for the first term, if this is taken away, what remains is a1. So I have a1 plus, so Right now, I took care of the first turn and the second turn. Now I have the remaining terms. So now what can I do? Let's look at the remaining terms. I see again, they all have a common factor, which is x minus x1, right? They all have that. So I perform this procedure again, and I take out x minus x1. And then, um, the leading term here will be a constant, a2, which comes from there, and then I just con continue doing so until I get to the last term. And let's say the last term, after taking out um, x minus x to the n minus 2, and after taking out a n minus 1, I am left with a n times x minus x n minus 1. Well, this is called the nested form is exactly it has a layer buried in another layer and buried in another layer and buried in another layer and then finally comes out it's like in a nest now we take a look at how this nested form can be effectively coded so i will give in something called pseudocode it's like the algorithm that you will be needed to carry out this computation and you will have to translate the pseudocode into the syntax of the corresponding language that you're using here, for example, the MATLAB syntax. Now let's say I am given a data set xi and I'm given all the coefficients ai for i from 0, 1 and n and I want to compute 
the value of the Newton's polynomial Pn evaluated at x. Okay, so x is given also. And I want to put this value in the variable I call it P. So the algorithm will start actually from the innermost layer of the nested form and compute this value first and then peel like layer by layer by layer to come all the way out. And basically following um, the order of operation when you have all these brackets. So the iteration is initiated by setting p equals to a n, which is this value here. And once this is set, and then we go through a for loop to get out of this nth layer. So a for loop, let's say k is the index for my for loop, it goes from n minus 1 to n minus 2, it reduces each time until it reaches 0. And then at level k, I do the following computation. So this will be the pk that I have here, and then pk will be multiplied with x minus xk. That's what I have here. And then this mm, will be adding on top of this ak here, and then this is the new p-value for the next computation of the for loop. And the for loop continues until k reaches 0, which means the final number that will be added is a0, and then you end your code, and you have the Newton's polynomial computed. Now let's take a look at a computational efficiency for this code. We want to see how many flops it uses. So um, for p equals to an, that's just assignment, that takes nothing. And then let's look at the for loop. So how long is the for loop? Well, k goes from n minus 1 all the way to 0, so the total number here is n, right? So n loops, and in each loop, what do you have to do? Well, you do a subtraction, multiplication, addition, so three flops, right? So the total work will be n times 3. So we concluded that this requires only 3n flops, comparing to the regular form, which requires n plus 1 square flops. This is a dramatic improvement. Okay, um, that's um, all for Newton's divided difference. And uh, there will be a homework problem where um, you're supposed to code Newton's divided difference and extract the relevant a values, the coefficients, and also code the nested form efficiently in the program to evaluate the values of the polynomial. That's all for this video. See you next time.